everybody uh, this is the third segment of the evolution chapter um, and I stopped at this uh, phenotype versus genotype uh, picture uh, which actually is uh, the result of Mendel's experiment um, here the phenotype was that he actually put um, the phenotype is the characteristic so it's the the color of the plants and the genotype is showing you the the different genes the the dominant versus the recessive genes the his experiment was that that he planted a bed of purple flower uh, pea plants and from farther away he had some white pea plants and he made sure that all the purples were fertilized with old white um, pea plants and the first generation after he fertilized the purple uh, flowers with the white flowers that he had 75% uh, of all the plants were purple and only 25% showed up as white. So what he realized here is that there are, there are some kind of um, characteristics about them which which is more dominant than, than others. So basically what he come up with, and now we know it really, really clear that we have this genotype where, where the people and can be homozygous or it could be heterozygous. But even if it's heterozygous, if, it, uh, if the dominant allele is present, the, the plant is always gonna be purple because the purple is dominant. And the, the only way that you can get the recessive alleles if, if you inherit that from both parents. So Therefore, it's logical that you have to have two-thirds of the pea plants um, as purple and only one-third, which could be um, white. This is another way of explaining the phenotype versus genotype. Like uh, in this case, the dominant allele is the, the capital S, and that will produce smooth uh, seed on the peas. Uh, so when you have the two dominant together, of course, it's going to be smooth right here. But if you have the, the the one dominant and one recessive, because of the dominance presence, you're going to have smooth seeds. So the only way you can have wrinkled seeds, if you have two recessive um, allele together, that's the only way. So now let's move on and try to talk about the the evolution itself, like the different types and so on. So first we have to define what is a species. And the biological species is a, is a population, a population whose members are able to mate with each other and produce fertile offspring. Or would if they came in contact. So the main thing is that like in the human population, every single body can reproduce a fertile offspring if, if you get together with anyone, basically. Um, so this is what we call biological species. And then you have the subspecies, uh, which, which means that those are populations of the same species uh, who are living in different areas, and they do have some differences. You know, like originally in Europe was the white Europeans, in Asia was the Asians, like uh, in, in Mexico was all the Hispanics, and Spain, of course. And um, they were populations of the same species living at different areas with some differences. When you put them together, then everything starts mixing. So this actually, uh, kind of clears up the, the biological species concept, which is based on the interfertility and not based on differences. So you understand it doesn't matter what color or what shape a human is, as long as they get together, they can mate and they can produce fertile offspring. They belong into the same species. Um, so the differences don't matter really that much. So now we're going to talk about the mechanism of evolution. Uh, basically, we have to talk about how does evolution work? What are the selective forces that, that causes evolution to occur? How can we get genetically different organisms that they came from the same uh, common ancestor? So basically, we will be talking about the micro versus the macro evolution. So microevolution is going to be the small scale changes within a species 
to produce to produce new varieties or species in relatively short amount of time, whereas the macroevolution is when one genus or family evolves into another because of large scale changes that take place over long period of time. And we, call, we also call this speciation. So basically you can see the microevolution. Basically you can see the microevolution in small scale like here. And when you have long time, then you're gonna see the macroevolution. So the main thing is that what we are unable to see ma major macro evolution is because we only live like eight years on Earth, so you just don't have enough time to do so. So let's start with the micro evolution, and um, that is the changes in relative in the relative frequency of alleles in a population over time. We have five mechanisms we have to learn. One is the mutation, the migration, genetic drift, non-random mating, and natural selection. I will ask this. Either you take test online and you are in the distance learning class, or if you are in face-to-face -face class, in either way, I will ask this. So you have to know them, and you also have to understand them. So we're going to start with the mutation. And the mutation are inheritable changes to the genotype of an organism. So the main thing is that, uh, like, just because your father lost his hand doesn't mean that all the kids are going to inherit that. The change has to be in the sex cells to be able to inherit the change. So uh, it is very important that if, if something happens to you during your lifetime, that doesn't make you your kids to inherit that change. Uh, mutation always occur randomly and spontaneously within a population. Um, and most mutation, most of them are neutral. Like if somebody has six fingers or if somebody born with a tail or somebody has an extra ear or I don't know, whatever. Uh, these are mostly like uh, neutral. But then there are some mutations which are very harmful. If somebody born with, with open heart, that's a mutation, but the person cannot survive because it's a very harmful mutation. And sometimes the mutation can be very, very, very good. Now, if the, if the mutation is actually very good for the environment, then there is a good chance that that person will be able to live long and reproduce, so therefore that mutation will be inherited. Uh, and adding new alleles to, the, to, the, to that population. Uh, Changing the amount of each allele present, mutation is the ultimate source of genetic variation. So therefore, this is the one which creates the raw material upon which natural selection acts. Because if the mutation is good for the environment, then naturally that's going to be able to reproduce and more and more of it will be in the population. It's very logical, actually. The next one is the, oh, I, I have on the next slide, I have an ex example of, of, of this um, mutation thing. There is this very interesting mutation in, in humans, and we call it the CCRD32 allele. And this, this actually is a protein, which if you lock it, it, uh, it normally is on the surface of your blood cells, but if you don't have that, then the homozygous individuals are essentially cannot get AIDS. So it's a pretty good thing to have right today. And did, this mutation didn't happen because of the presence of AIDS. Actually, this mutation was much, much older. Like, for example, if you had this mutation, uh, you didn't get the bubonic plaque. So most likely this is where the mutation aroused because people with this mutation could survive bubonic plaque and now their ancestor will not get AIDS. So it's a very, very uh, good mutation to have actually. The next one, the next uh, is the migration. And the migration basically is the movement into and out of population. But it's important because it can change the allele frequency uh, in the gene pool of the population. Like if you have immigration, which means individuals are coming into the population, that will actually be able to add variation to the existing population. If you have 
emigration that actually can remove individuals with variation from a population. Like if somebody has a horrible genetic disease and that person moves away, that takes that genetic disease out of the population so others cannot get it. So it could be good or if it's a really good mutation and the person emigrates, then nobody else can get it. So it could be very good and it could not, it, it could be not that good. Uh, many species, many, not just humans, but other animals encourage migration. You know, if the food supply is low and they migrate away or something like that, which can cause more gene flow, which is the process of transferring genes among different populations. And the next one is the genetic drift. And the genetic drift is the random changes allele frequency due to the population size. If you have a small population and something changes, there is a much better chance to those changes to spread. Whereas if you have a large population, it takes a whole while for the, for the changes to take place. It's logical. And the next one is the founder effect. And that will happen when you have a few individuals moving to somewhere else and colonize a new area. Like somebody, like the Amish community. The Amish people came over from Europe and colonized in an area and they don't go out of that area. They actually mating with each other. So if, if, if the original small population, there was one person with a bad genetic diseases, then it can really easily spread because they interbreed, we call it, like they mate with each other and the population is very small. That's the founder effect. And there is a lot of area where you can actually really see this. The next one is the bottleneck effect. Bottleneck effect happens when there is like a major disaster, like a big flood, big volcanic eruption and the population size really reduced to a itty bitty teeny tiny. You might have that the original population had different uh, big differences but after the bottleneck effect happens some of the, the variations are taken out so basically the, the allele frequency change compared to the original population so that's the bottleneck effect. The next one is the non-random mating that is happening when we have limited number of species, limited number of individuals, and that can also impact the mating. Uh, it can really influence the allele frequencies because the mates can be limited by geography. Like if you are in, a, in an island and there is only like three or four people you can mate with, you know, that really changes the allele frequency to just those individuals. Or sometimes the, the mates are chosen for their traits. Somebody wants uh, people with spiky hairs and like all the girls want that, so therefore only the spiky hair guys get to be mating. Or the mates can be more closely related to each other, like, like uh, people just wanna mate with certain other ones. So you know how the mating is happening. The last one is the natural selection. That is the process by which individuals are more fit to an environment, therefore they can survive and reproduce. And you see that with the deer all the time, that the deers are fighting with each other and the ones which are the best for the environment, the ones who can grow muscles or able to fight are the ones who get to reproduce. Like you can see this with humans. I mean, look at yourself. How many of you going to the gym to make nice muscles so all the girls would choose you to mate with or the, for the girls you know you have to have be beautiful hair and you know like everybody is doing that to be picked and mate with so the interaction of populations and the environment results in a challenging changing sorry changing allele frequencies we have four different kinds of natural selection the stabilizing the directional disruptive and the sexual selection that's the most no, I'm just kidding so let's go through them the first one is the stabilizing selection 
This occurs when individuals with the very average, the most average form of the trait are the most fit for the environment. So uh, therefore, the extreme traits are going to be eliminated, like this, these individuals with, with very different traits. They are going to be eliminated because these are the ones <clears throat> who get to mate. Um, this is the most common form of natural selection, and it works in every population all the time. The next one is the directional uh, selection. That happens when individuals with one extreme variation are the most fit for the environment. So this will actually cause a gradual shift in the allele frequency to that extreme. So that's going to be the good one. So therefore, like the most in England, like during the uh, industrial industrialization, there was full with this dark uh, dust particles so if if a moth was really white they've been eaten so therefore the ones which are darker could survive so the the allele frequency went toward that extreme so that's how it happens the directional selection um an example another example because i just said the the uh moth the uh, uh, directional another one is the ant eater the ant eaters you know they eat ants but the way they do it that they put their tongue into the ant nest and then the ant uh, sticks to that tongue and because of the way the termite mounds are built the longer the ant eaters tongue the better it gets food so therefore the the ant eater with the longest tongue could survive and reproduce so therefore it went to that direction. The next one is the disruptive selection, and that is when both of the extremes are the most fit for the environment. Uh, and that is, um, that is what actually gets selected against the other ones. Like if, if you have a, a clam, which has two colors. One is which similar to the sand and the other one which is similar to the very common rocks on the beach. And then the most normal ones are being eaten because they are very, very uh, bright and they can be eaten because it's easy to find them. Therefore, the other two is going to be surviving rather. And the last one, which is quite important even for us, I'm just joking, is the sexual selection. And sexual selection is the competition for mates within a population, causing differences to occur in the allele frequency of the two genders. Mates tend to be chosen for their phenotypes, and females tend to choose the males. I don't know if it's true for us, Adam. Yeah, I think it is true. What do you think? Is it the male choosing the females or the females choosing the males? In the animal world, I think it's true for the human birds too. In the animal world, it's definitely the, the female choose the mates, the male. So therefore, um, it depends on that. And there is a good example here, like the pe peacocks. Uh, the male peacocks have large tail feathers that make it difficult. So basically, the bigger the, the tail feather, the harder for this guy to get away from the predators and, and to, to fly or to run. But because the female particularly select the, the peacocks with the nicest tail, that is the one which gets uh, selected instead of... Uh, Uh, this is a very interesting concept, the artificial selection. Uh, and one of the reasons that we know that the natural selection is working is because humans actually can change and can do very creamy, uh, they, they can create very similar process uh, by picking and choosing, so therefore changing the evolution, the evolution. It's very interesting. I don't know how many of you thought of it, but that's just the way it is. And I guess now I'm going to stop because I'm at 19 minutes. So I will see you in the next section.